Um, first, I want to thank you, Per, for this opportunity, uh, for honoring me with this opportunity. Although I have to say, I can't quite understand why you would pick me, uh, because as you know from this morning, I'm the person who was hacked yesterday, but also I have the privilege of being a person who's had the same password for 15 years. And just to make you hate me a little more, it includes my name. So now knock yourselves out <laughs> and try and figure it out. Um, my name, it, well, first I want to say that it's been, it's been really great being here with you. I was just here today, but I learned so much, and it's really uh, reassuring and heartwarming to know that such you know, qualified, intelligent men and women like yourselves are working on what I think is one of the most pressing issues of our times, PowerPoint. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, just, I see some problems up here. Okay. No, um, digital security and information security. Uh, so my name is Marie, uh, Marie Baleo, so I'm French. Uh, it happens to the best of us. I am 28 years old. I come from Paris, and I work as, a, um, as head of publications at a think tank on urban transitions. And much of what I do professionally and, and personally as well revolves around writing, which has always been the only thing uh, I was interested in, and it's what I hope to keep doing uh, with the rest of my life. And it is in this context that I created uh, an online magazine when I was 25 years old, um, which was called Not Magazine, and I edited and wrote uh, long-form articles on international relations, uh, politics, technology, and security also, but also cultural and social issues. Uh, and it is in this context that I, I met Ped on Twitter, I think, about three years ago. Um, and now I, I write a little bit different um, things from, from what I used to do before. I've been writing a lot of fiction and a lot of poetry. So that's, that's just to explain that I don't know anything about passwords, and please don't ask me any technical questions ever. But if you have a solution for my Uber hack, I'm right here. So. <laughs> Okay, um, so when Ped initially offered this opportunity, I was really enthusiastic, uh, and I thought it was in July, I think, when things started coming together, and I was on summer vacation in August, and I thought, you know, oh, by the end of August, I'll have this wonderful speech prepared, and I'll just stroll up here, and you know, you'll have your jaws on the floor, and you'll have your mouth slightly open, and you will be drooling. I'm getting a little bit carried away. Um, but I really thought I'd have it, and this vision did not come true in August. It didn't come true in September, where I was really, really stressed out about it, and it barely only came true in October. And the reason for that is that I really struggled with several different questions. The first one being, uh, what is security? And I'm sure you probably all have answers to that. Well, I, I don't. Uh, why does security matter? And what can I possibly teach you, security professionals, about it that you don't already know? Or what can I tell you that at least would be, if not of value, but at least of interest to you? And after asking myself these questions over and over again and not getting anywhere, I ended up uh, turning to the very beginning of my life for answers. And I bring you... Oh, God, it's happening again. <laughs> I'm cursed with this, like... No, I, okay. It's, is it on? Nothing works. I am doomed. It's. I've done it. I've jinxed it all. I jinxed it all. No, no, no. Where's the like on button here? Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. So this is my mother. Let me check. I'll just. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and also, if my mom's watching this, I want to apologize for using her picture because I did not use the permission. So, um, yeah, here she is, and she's really beautiful. And this is me. I'm the thing in the lower corner. Uh, and this is circa 1991. I was a year and a half years old, and my mom, my dad, and I lived on the French Riviera where I was born. Um, and my dad was in the process of getting his physics PhD at the time. And one day, my mom and I went to visit him in his office. And I was usually a pretty quiet child. This is my version of the kitten picture, by the way. But <laughs> um, I was like a good-natured kid, pretty quiet. But that day, I was, I believe the technical term is rage crying. And so my parents did what any loving, caring parent would do. They stuffed my mouth with food until I would just shut the hell up. Um, so they gave me a piece of a Snickers bar, and that allowed them to buy themselves enough quiet time to take me shopping. And so we went to a store, the three of us together, um, and then I started coughing a little bit at first, and then more and more. And my dad thought that it probably was just the AC, um, so he took me outside, and there he saw that on my wrists I had these red stains. And they were everywhere, and he'd never seen anything like it. He'd never seen sort of like weird skin pigmentation like that. So he just thought, you know, 
like weird face emoji, whatever. Um, so when my mom came out of the store a bit later, she, she was a nurse by training, uh, she figured that something was weird. So my parents did the next logical thing and took me to a bar. Uh, so you, <laughs> two adults and a kid walk into a bar, it's not the start of a joke. Uh, but, and they asked for the next, uh, you know, where's the closest doctor? And so my dad, took me in his armpit and brought me to the closest doctor's office mid-session. The patient wasn't happy, and he was like, what do I do with this? Uh, and the doctor called an ambulance, and I was taken to a hospital. And that is how my lifelong marriage with something called anaphylaxis began. Uh, anaphylaxis, which apparently you're familiar with, uh, is a life-threatening, it is a very severe type of allergic reaction that, if left untreated, can cause cardiac arrest or death. And in the hospital, I was diagnosed with a life-threatening allergy to peanuts, um, tree nuts, and uh, as well, more minor allergies to a bunch of other things. Um, and over the years through my childhood, the list of food items that I was forbidden from eating would extend to over 30. And the medical term for this is freak of nature. I'll have you know. Yep. <laughs> um, and so this really, really changed my parents' life. Their life became sort of governed by fear, as you would if you're a 25-year-old who suddenly has a, a baby with a, a life-threatening illness that you've never heard of before. And this was uh, 1990s France, so it wasn't very common there either. Um, and the only thing that kept this fear at bay and that kept it manageable on a day-to-day -day basis was security. Um, and, you know, but even then, security couldn't do everything. So when I was a kid, I ended up in the ER, I think two Christmases in a row, because at the time, uh, chocolate labels were less than thorough in France. But my parents were hopeful by nature, uh, and that didn't work out. So <laughs> I ended up in the, in the hospital, and I remember this one particularly daunting time for, I think, probably for my dad, uh, where I was waiting on an ambulance with my dad, and I was holding his hand. And the thing that you get when you have this sort of life-threatening alert reaction is that your whole system kind of shuts down gradually because all of your blood is flowing to your heart because that's where the need is. Well, I'm not, you will see from the words I use, I'm not a medical person. But um, I remember very, very well the sensation that actually it's pretty close to what you get if you're about to pass out, if any of you has ever experienced that. Um, so I told my dad, and I quote, like, I am leaving, which is, you know, granted a terrifying thing to hear for a parent. Um, and then I was about six years old at that time, and it's about the same time I understood uh, a first important lesson is that no amount of preparedness can fully eliminate risk. So that was the first thing. But all through this, I never felt unsafe through some miracle. Like I was, I was immortal, I was protected, I was insulated, I put my fingers in the outlet and told my parents I'd survived. Like I felt like nothing could hurt me ever. And that sense of safety, whether you consider it justified or not, is what allowed me to, you know, be a regular kid and do the things that would make me become myself, such as, you know, read lots of books, um, daydream, listen to Pink Floyd, ride my bike, etc. So that was safety. Um, and then security, on the other hand, I think, was all of the hard work that my parents put in behind the scenes, you know, talking to doctors, uh, working out emergency protocols with schools, and just, you know, generally educating the hundreds of people that came in contact with me through my childhood so they wouldn't, you know, accidentally kill me or whatever. <laughs> And so this hard work, it extended to, you know, holding my hand while I was going through some really tough times. It extended to, you know, violating speed limits to get me to the ER on time, like while I had this sublingual adrenaline at the time, like sloshing under my tongue. And I was like, this tastes so weird and I'm going to die. And, you know, it was, uh, it was really hard work. And I think I realized then that, you know, the rules that my parents had put in place after a few years were very strict. I couldn't do, like, most of the things a normal kid could do. I couldn't go on class trips. I couldn't eat the birthday cake with other kids. I couldn't do things that I felt were a really important part of every other child's life. And this really sucked. Like, I hated it. I had to carry, like, a shitty little belt, I'm sorry, with, like, a, an EpiPen in it, and I had to, it looked really bad, like, you know, I was already geekish looking, so it wasn't helping with the whole popularity contest from high school, middle school, et cetera. But, you know, I had to realize that even though it sucked, um, all of this hard work was really paying off because day after day that passed, somehow, like, I was not dead yet, you know, I was still alive. Um, so that was, that's all for the kitten picture for now. Uh, well, actually, wait. So when I was 9 to 13 years old, I lived in Norway. 
There we go. And uh, four years of Norway and hundreds of pictures of Norway. I'm sorry that this is the one I picked. I don't know what went through me. I just thought that was a really cool moment. We saw an elk. Like, thank you. Thanks. You understand. <laughs> Um, and so Norway was really great, but then in 2003, when I was 13 years old, my father was posted to Lebanon, so we went and lived in Beirut, Lebanon instead. Um, and you le learn to live sort of very quickly with a certain degree of insecurity, because um, up to a certain point, you can use something really great that I highly recommend, that I use all the time, it's called denial. Uh, it's a great <laughs> defense mechanism, and it probably helps that Lebanon looked like this. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been, but I lived in paradise. Let me show you a couple more pictures. This is Beirut. So, sure, it was a little strange. Um, you know, there were soldiers everywhere. Uh, I passed a tank on my way to school. Um, there were buildings everywhere that had been very visibly torn down or sort of ravaged by the terrible civil war um, that raged in Lebanon between 1975 and 1990. Um, my dad used to have this little piece of paper in the glove compartment with the word landmine written on it in Arabic uh, that he'd like hold up and like check if it matched the <laughs> sign outside. Um, and so it was, in a way, very uh, not typical, and especially coming from Norway, which is a very quiet environment. Uh, but, you know, I don't have to tell you that one of the great powers that we have as human beings is that we adapt to things very quickly, and I think just after a few weeks, especially as a kid, you're extremely resilient. Um, these things, they faded into the background, and they were just part of the scenery for me, because above all else, there was all of the rest. And it's my mom again. Hi, mom. Okay, um, you know, the splendid trips everywhere in Lebanon, um, this is me, not, that, not my best phase, but, you know, the ruins and such beautiful, you know, history, such beautiful nature in Lebanon. I had great friends. We used to go to the mall, to the movies. We did Lord of the Rings marathons, and those were absolutely terrible. Never do those, ever. Uh, but yeah, you know, there was no shortage of beauty or happiness. And, you know, when things are this perfect, um, nothing can really go wrong, I think. Except um, they can. Spoiler. So when I was in math class one day in, I think, was probably, it's probably the equivalent of junior year of high school, uh, I heard a really, really loud bang like a very great commotion, and I thought that it was a gas bottle that had exploded somewhere. Um, and then we saw some large cloud of smoke rise from way behind the buildings. And this was before, at least for me, it was before the time of smartphones and you know, immediate information, etc. cetera. Um, so I had really no idea what had happened until we got out of class and all the parents were there. Um, and that morning, while we were in class, um, a truck that carried 1,800 kilograms of explosives uh, blew up in downtown Beirut uh, at the exact same moment when the convoy of the prime minister was passing by, um, and it killed him immediately. And it killed 20 people, and it wounded many, many more. And it was uh, seen and felt and heard for miles around, and it, it actually you know, dug a crater in a road that is you know, highly frequented in, in Lebanon, and I, I had just been on the day before with my dad. Um, so it was a really unexpected incident, and it changed a lot of things um, for us. Le Lebanon had been, I think, going through a pretty quiet phase in between the end of the Civil War and 2005 when this happened. Uh, and certainly since I'd been there in 2003, it had been really quiet and really peaceful. And suddenly there were you know, a lot of targeted killings, uh, targeted assassinations, um, targeting politicians, uh, journalists, you know, a lot of bombings and stuff, and it just really changed life for us from one day to the next because now there is an element of insecurity. But I never really, still through this, uh, felt unsafe ever, and those things as well I adapted to really quickly, just like I think everybody else did. Uh, and my dad actually had to check under the car with a mirror every day to see if there wasn't something stuck under the car. So it really changed things for us. And I remember actually that the day after it happened, um, my dad and I went downtown to see you know, what was going on. And people were paying their respects. Uh, and it was really quiet and full of people. And then suddenly I just saw this mob of journalists come running with their cameras and their mics and everything. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And then behind them, I see those two heads. I'll always remember this. Those two heads. And one of them is like a tall man with bald, 
like a, a bald head, and the small one is like a woman with curly hair. And that was actually the president of my country, France, and his wife. And I remember thinking, okay, something's happening, and like nothing's ever going to be the same here. So the death of the prime minister um, marked the beginning of something that is called the Cedar Revolution. Um, this is one month exactly to the day after his assassination. And uh, one million people came out to demonstrate out of a population of four million at the time, so you can imagine how big that was. Um, and they asked for Syrian uh, troops to leave the country. They asked for Lebanon to really be fully independent um, from its great neighbor, and they asked also to know the truth about the assassination of Hariri, so the prime minister. Um, and actually, one month later, in April, uh, Syrian troops, which had been there for 30 years, retreated from Lebanon um, for good. And many, many voices clamored and asked for independence. And one of the prime voices of the Cedar Revolution is this man. Um, his name is Samir Kassir. He was 45 years old at the time. Uh, Lebanese French journalist, uh, author, and history professor. And my father was on friendly terms with him. Um, we had all of his books at home, and like I had sort of a religious attitude towards the books. I remember opening them and being like, "Oh my God!" You know, the, the pages were glowing. I was like, "This is what true journalism is. This is what you know, good writing is." It made me want to write, essentially. And I remember meeting him this one time. My dad was like, "Go ahead and shake his hand." And I was like, "Oh my God!" <laughs> you know, starstruck. Um, and I remember thinking right then when I shook his hand, like I'm in the presence of some rare combination of you know, a kind person, like an, a stellar writer, and like a really intelligent human being. Um, and on June 2nd, um, 2005, he died starting his car um, in another bombing, so again, which I heard because I was home. And at that point, um, at that point I knew what that sound was. Uh, and I think I don't recall this exactly because it's hard to remember now because it's been 13 years. It's not like I haven't thought about it, but uh, I don't remember if I learned from turning on CNN, or if I learned from my dad calling and telling me who, he, who it was this time. Um, but I remember hearing the sound and thinking, Shh, you know, ugh, like again. And then I remember turning on the TV, and it was a really strange feeling at the time to be able to turn on like CNN, the, the American channel, when you were living in Lebanon, and to see familiar, you know, familiar places that you knew. And I saw that it was him. And I'll never forget that. And you know, I also saw, they, they filmed his funeral, so um, I saw the, the daughter, his daughter, and I recognized her to be uh, a girl from my school who I used to see all the time, but I just never realized that she was his daughter. Um, and it's been 13 years, and the investigation is still going on, and no one has been indicted yet. Um, <clears throat> and one year after this, I graduated, I'm actually really proud of this, I graduated from the French high school where he also graduated from. So, you know, very, very, uh, very proud of that. And so one month after I graduated high school, so in July 2006, um, Hezbollah abducted uh, two Israeli soldiers at the Lebanese, in the south of Lebanon um, and attempted to trade them for Lebanese people who were being held as prisoners in Israel. And Israel rejected the trade and instead launched an all-out war, um, not just in the south of Lebanon, where Hezbollah is historically more, more present, uh, but also you know, in southern districts of Beirut, and just generally uh, really hitting hard the infrastructure, uh, really causing trouble for the whole country. Uh, you know, whether it be electricity, the airport was bombed. Obviously, lots and lots of civilians were, were killed. Um, and this is damage in, I think, the southern districts of, of Beirut. Um, and this really, really, really blindsided everyone, I think. Uh, and I can only speak to my personal experience, and obviously, you know, I'm lucky enough that I didn't lose anyone or, you know, I wasn't hurt. Um, I, I did really, really well. I was in Lebanon for four days before I was brought out of Lebanon on a bus that drove all the way to Turkey. Um, so I can only speak, again, to my own experience, but I think this war was really what um, Nassim Nicholas Tayyip calls a black swan. It's like a completely... 
unpredictable event. And I'd been stressed out and anxious about a lot of things, like, you know, where was I going to go for college? Was I going to get into the dream college? You know, I was obviously really nervous about the allergies from time to time, but, you know, I never, ever could have expected this. And I think sometimes the risk that materializes is not at all a risk you ever considered. And even if you'd considered it, you would still, you know, rationally have found it so unlikely to happen that you wouldn't actually have been able to worry about it. And this thing really swept the rug from under our feet completely. And I think that was, you know, a, a big part of that, <clears throat> that experience for me is, and I was actually talking to a Lebanese psychologist the other day who told me that this war had made a lot of damage, a lot of damage on Lebanese people psychologically. And that got me thinking, and I think it's got to do with that surprise element. And what, how that relates to what I've been trying to tell you about security uh, is, again, that you can't prepare for everything. And sometimes, you know, there's an added element of, of trauma when <laughs> the thing that happens is not at all something that you, you could have predicted. So uh, I, didn't, I only returned to Lebanon like a, a year later, uh, but that was for a short while. But then the next significant time that I went to Lebanon, I was 21 years old. And this is the story that you really like. <laughs> um, and I stayed with friends for a whole summer. I interned at a, a law firm. And so I stayed with my best friend's parents, essentially, uh, but she wasn't there. So it was just me and the parents, and the lady of the household asked her driver if he would take me out on a little trip to the south of Lebanon, to a little town called Tyr, which is really beautiful, uh, because this was something that she used to do when people from abroad were visiting. Uh, so I said yes, and I was really excited and everything. So I got in the car with um, Hassan, the driver, and after a bit, he looked at me and he was like, you know Tia is boring, right? And I was like, yeah, I know. And so he was like, well, where would you want to go instead? And so that is how we found ourselves trying to get to the Israeli border, because apparently the first thing I thought of when I thought excitement was, let's go to the Israeli border. So I had been there before, um, but much earlier when I was a teenager again, uh, but, and with my dad, who had friends who were locals and who knew the place, so this was obviously a whole different uh, situation, and it was also different times. Uh, now there was a law forbidding foreigners from going to the border without a permit and a good reason, but I was a 21-year-old shithead, and that's all the authorization I needed. Um, so we set out for the, for the border, and we were stopped at a first checkpoint where, you know, obviously they asked if I had a permit, and I didn't have one, so we were asked to turn around. Um, and so we turned around, but Hassan suggested trying to find, you know, alternate ways to get there, like shortcuts and little roads, and I was like, yeah, you know, it's an adventure, let's do it, everything. So that's how we ended up, I think, one hour later, uh, and I took these really shitty pictures, but try taking a good picture from a moving car, okay, and then, and then judge me. Um, so it's a heavily fenced, heavily patrolled, heavily whatever, everything, heavily secured area uh, with UNIFIL, so the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, um, which is there. And so by that point, I'd obviously violated international law, but I didn't care. Um, and it wasn't enough, so I came to this place, and I asked Hassan to stop, and I wanted to take a picture. So I get out of the car. You're laughing. Stop. <laughs> This is ridiculous, I know. I was wearing my little flowery skirt and like my knockoff Ray-Bans, and I go like, this is it, I'm going to take a picture. So I get out of the car, and in this little thing is a person with a megaphone who is like, get back in the car and put the camera away. So naturally what I do is I turn around and I take this brilliant thing, <laughs> and then I ask Hassan, who all through this, mind you, never wanted to get out of the car, to take this one. And all through this, the guy in the megaphone is like, people are useless, essentially. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it was a really funny thing to do, and I had lot, obviously I had a lot of fun, but I never realized whether that I was putting myself in danger, and I see you laughing. I still don't realize that I really put myself in danger, or Hassan, who, again, all through this, never came out of the car. And the reason for this is not that I'm like some wild little teenage you know, rebel shithead who you know, doesn't care about security or anything. It's just that I didn't think I was in danger, and, I, and on some level, I still don't think I was in danger. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is because in Lebanon, contrary to every other place I lived, uh, I had found a place where I could do these abnormal things in impunity. Um, and I did a lot of reckless things in Lebanon. I once rode in a truck of a car, a moving car, so that was weird. <laughs> but um, I think the reason I did that is because I had found a place where it was 
you know, quote unquote normal. And if that was normal, then all the rest, like the war, the misery, you know, the, the innocent people being really miserable, all of that was just also normal and not the complete, total, you know, disaster and heartbreak that it had been. So I think that contained also a, a lesson in security. My, my radar for personal safety was kind of broken. My best friend used to tell me I was reckless, but I was just like, okay, I'm flattered, but I don't think it's true. I just think you're a little bit like a coward yourself. <laughs> and, and so yeah, that taught me a, an important lesson about safety, but only like years and years later, I have to say. Um, but now I'm gonna take you a little bit closer to where I live now. Um, so I live in Paris. Beautiful unsplash picture of Paris, by the way. So uh, when I was 25 years old, I realized my lifelong dream of taking drumming lessons uh, because I thought it would help me cope with the fact that I have like no motor skills at all. It didn't help at all. Don't try it, it's just bad for your self-esteem. Uh, but anyway, I took lessons for a really long time. And uh, I used to have these Friday night lessons that I really liked with this really cool guy my age who was really, you know, very patient with me all through these, uh, these weeks. And one day I was sitting at work uh, playing Candy Crush, and not my current employer, mind you. Um, and when I received a message from a good friend of mine who I really, really liked, and he was like, will you go see a concert with me tonight? Uh, and this was a band called the Eagle, Eagles of Death Metal, so not spontaneously the kind of thing that I would want to <laughs> listen to, judging by the name of it. Um, so originally I was like, ugh, oh, you know, not sure and everything, but then I thought, okay, I really like this guy, it's going to be fun, there will be beer, there will be music, let's go. So, but I didn't text him back, I just kept playing Candy Crush, because once you've started, you can never stop. Um, and then a couple hours later, I was like, the guilt crept up on me, and I was like, oh, you know, these lessons are prepaid, I'm going to be an ass to my teacher again, let's not go. So instead, I did go to the drumming lesson um, at 9.30 p.m., and when I came out from the underground studio with my teacher, it was, I think, about 10.30. And uh, the studio owner told us that we couldn't get out because there had been shootings and explosions at the Stade de France, so the football stadium, the soccer stadium, whatever. Um, and so we just brought down the curtains, the sort of iron curtains that you know, connected us to the street, and just locked down completely. And so that evening was uh, 13 November 2015, which I'm sure all of you know, uh, because that night 130 people were killed in, uh, in Paris, uh, 90 of them. Uh, at the Bataclan, which is a concert hall in Paris. Um, <coughs> and so we started watching television. Uh, I was talking to you at some point, I remember. I was talking to a lot of people. Everyone was calling everyone. We were all on lockdown and everything. Uh, the president declared a state of emergency. And at one point, uh, the two neurons that I have finally connected, and I was like, concert. Uh, so I googled Eagles of Death Metal for the first and, and last time in my life, and the first thing that came up was, you know, terrorist attack. So that's when I figured out that my friend was in there. Uh, so I called him, but then uh, I heard on television or on Twitter that, uh, you know, the terrorists were shooting the people whose phones were ringing, so I stopped calling, <laughs> uh, and I texted instead. And it was the longest, I think, 20 minutes of my life before uh, my friend eventually answered. and. Uh, yeah, I still, I, I still, it's one of those things I don't realize, just like danger generally and lack of safety, but yeah, I still don't realize that I was almost there and I even don't even remember what actual decision-making process was involved in, in not going there. You know, I don't actually remember the moment where I was like, oh, I'll not go. And I think that is a lesson when it relates to security because you know, you can never, you can prepare for anything you like, you can be paranoid all the time, you can consider all the risks, but sometimes it's just going to come down to blind luck and to some dumb spur-of-the-moment decision that you don't even remember making, and that's going to change the course of your life in one sense or another for good, and that you cannot anticipate. So that, I think, is one of the limitations of security, in a sense. So, but I don't want to leave you on such a sad, dreary note. Um, so what I want to tell you, you know, is that today, I've, I've talked a lot about physical safety, uh, but today, obviously, this is compounded by digital safety, right? The privacy of our communications, um, our data, 
you know, um, our reputation. I've been on the losing side of a hack, not just the one yesterday with Uber, but <laughs> a bunch of other ones. And it wasn't fun. Uh, it really sucks. It's like a huge violation. Uh, and it can really, you know, beyond the trauma of like obviously being hacked and being really nervous about, you know, whether someone's going to be able to access your private conversations and your money in your bank account. Um, it's, it's, you know, it can really compromise a life, I think. But at the same time, while security is crucial, I think it's important to remember to live our lives and to do the things that security exists to protect, right? And so namely, for example, speak our minds. And I think that's really important because I think at this right period right now when we're alive, a lot of um, individual liberties are jeopardized in a lot of different places. And I think we're so used to these liberties that we're almost not quite you know, realizing what's happening, or maybe we're just in denial about it. And I think at a time when, you know, the leader of the quote-unquote free world, or of what used to be, I think, the largest superpower in the world, is a man who routinely entices hatred of journalists, and at a time when a journalist was, you know, gruesomely murdered in an embassy, and honestly, no one really seems to care, I think it's important to remember that, yes, security is crucial, but it must not obscure what I would call the larger fights, because there are voices that are actively trying to silence free speech. And as long as these voices exist, it is our duty as citizens to fight them. So that's what I really, I really want to say about freedom of speech. But beyond that, you know, security exists to protect our right to go anywhere we want, our right to you know, determine ourselves the course of our lives and not let anyone else do that for us. And so I think it's important for us to, you know, exert those rights every day. So if you're, if you want to go to like a metal concert, even though it's not your thing, you go right ahead and do that. Uh, if you're a journalist and you want to speak up against your government, you go ahead and do that. And if you're a 21-year-old idiot who wants to violate international law, don't go ahead and do that, or maybe <laughs> do go ahead and do that. Do, do whatever you want. You know, take the risks, have the conversations that you wouldn't want to see put online ever, and just you know, take the risks. It will always be worth it, and that's my, my message for today, so thank you. <laughs>